G'day guys and welcome, my name's Michael and I am the Dead Aussie Gamer, here to share with you my tips, tricks, ideas and strategies for playing and running tabletop role-playing games. In today's very special video on gender performance, we are joined by the ever-talented Janet from World Anvil. G'day Janet! Hello, hello, thank you for having me back. Oh, it's always fantastic. We did so well last time, I thought we'd do it again. Uh, and maybe fun. a third time, but we'll see. What we do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, today's episode is a very interesting one because um, we had received a question earlier on uh, about voice acting and performance work. Um, this question actually uh, came in response to a video that I had made earlier on about um, doing voice acting uh, as a man. Um, now the, the request was about um, how one would uh, basically do a voice of a man as a woman. And I thought, who better to ask than a, uh, a woman? So uh, here we are, and we are going to be doing this very special, very awesome show about um, performing uh, the gender... Uh, that you wish to, whether that be a male, whether that be a female, um, and some of the basic key elements of performance work that you'll need to know in order to play and portray the character that you desire. So to begin, let's find out a bit about Janet, because Janet's actually got a lot of information about this. I mean, you guys know who I am. Uh, you guys know I'm a, a trained actor, and I've done theater work and stuff like that. Uh, all of my stuff really comes down from stand-up comedy and, and a little bit of voice acting work. Uh, but Janet's stuff is absolutely amazing. So I'm going to let her tell you all about the amazing, the amazing Janetness that is about to exit her face hole. OK, I feel like I've been over-introduced here. No, go but, on. Um, <laughs> So my background is uh, I've been on the stage since I was sort of seven or eight years old. Um, and specifically, I'm a trained opera singer. And in the opera world, even more than in the acting world, where I have also had some experience, uh, you play other genders all the time. It is very, very common. Um, and depending on the kind of voice that you have, a lot of women end up playing boys or adolescent boys. So sort of very young men, essentially. It's, it's incredibly common. And so it's something that we as opera singers have to think about all the time. Now, um, when Michael asked me to come on the show, I was like, well, you know, I have my ideas about this and I know how it's done in the opera world. But I went and did some research because I have a very academic background. Um, and a lot of the studies that I read were incredibly interesting and fortunately backed up what I already thought, which is always a nice thing when you go and do some research. <laughs> And you're reading studies and they, they say exactly what you you had thought and you had observed in the real life and from the real world as well. Um, as actors, as opera singers, as anybody who's portraying something, somebody else. We spend a lot of time watching people and I don't want that to sound creepy, but I've clocked in a lot of hours sitting in coffee shops just watching how other people exist to understand how I can portray other people. So that's where all of this information is coming from in addition to research that I've done because I want to give you guys the goods, basically. Yeah, no, see, I, I'm exactly the same. Uh, as an actor and a performer, um, part of what we do is we get taught mimicry, which is very much um, everything from facial expressions to the gait when people walk um, to try and replicate and copy that. So um, what I ended up doing for my research for this video uh, was I actually went and I found out people who was surprisingly um, voiced by um, male, male characters who were voiced by women and women characters who were voiced by men. And there were actually quite a lot of them, some of which um, people um, just were completely unaware of. Uh, for example, uh, Bart Simpson's um, voice actor is a female, a very famous one. Um, and uh, in addition, um, slightly less known, I guess, uh, is one of the most masculine characters I've seen in any anime is Goku from Dragon Ball Z. This 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 testosterone filled violent dude who does nothing but eat and neglect his child. Um, he is actually voiced by a uh, a female voice actor in Japan. Um, so it 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 does bear in a question like you know how is it that these characters um, uh, how are these actors portraying them in, in such a great way and and I think we've come up with some some pretty interesting techniques for you guys to uh, to enjoy uh, the first thing we're going to be discussing is of course pitch and tone fluctuation uh, so Janet tell us a bit about pitch and tone fluctuation so this is one of my favorite topics partly because it's one of the ones that people get wrong the most so when the the stereotype of what happens when somebody is playing a female character as a man 
is the Monty Python. Uh, this is my personal tone for it. Which is why they talk like this. And everyone sounds like they're just like a Muppet. Like they've he, got a hand. He's Shut not the messiah. Boy. He's a very naughty boy. Right, exactly. <laughs> it's But you can hear my own speech tone. is way lower than that. Male men and women generally do not have a huge differentiation in native pitch. It's sort of a fifth or a sixth in talking in music terms, but it's not more than that. Um, and you you don't have to falsely make your voice high when you're a woman. You don't have to falsely make your voice low when you're playing a man. It's not necessary, uh, particularly in a gaming space, because they already know. You've probably described this person already. So they already, you've set the scene for your gamers of what to expect. So don't feel that you have to go full stereotype. You don't have to go full Monty Python. You can do it for effect if you want to show that this person has a particularly high and squeaky voice or a particularly low and gravelly voice. I played uh, a very large orc called Graal at one point. He was six foot six. He liked weeing off things. That was part of his shtick. I don't know. I always end up playing these ridiculous characters. Um, he was very, he was a man's man. And so for him, I felt it was a good choice. So I made his voice really low when I talk like this. But that was already in the concept, in the in the concept and in the space of a character ha that had been described. Incidentally, was... um, I've also uh, played women in the in a similar fashion. I had a uh, a very elegant uh, French woman by the name of Esmeralda, who had a very delicate voice, and when she spoke, she had this cadence to her that almost sounded uh, melodic, even though it sounds still quite masculine. Uh, when people um, started hearing her, and when she she started to uh, accent herself, oh, pardon me, Monsieur. Um, I don't suppose you know where the railway station is. And she would then wink seductively. These, um, the, the cadence, the simple, um, without obviously changing my natural tone, which is still quite, you know, deep, um, that, 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 you know, that, that simple sound that, um, that rounded the character out made the character just come to life, you know. I'm so glad that you brought that up because one of the things that I dug up in my research, which was something that I, I had known, but I had not had the specifics of, was that women use but about five or six tones when they're talking, like different pitches within a sentence, and men use about three. So what oh. you're getting from that is that women move the voice between the pitches much more, as you can hear I'm doing right now, but men tend to talk on one level much more. Mm. And that is a very simple way to change the gender or the perceived gender of a character is to change how much the voice fluctuates in pitch as you go through a sentence. So the way you just did Esmeralda with this uh, very beautiful cadence that went up and it went down, it's very feminine. Mm. And it comes across as very feminine. And it's something that you can use as a tool very genuinely to give feminine characteristics to any character. Mm. And, um, and, and on that note, with the, um, with the obviously the rise and the low, um, I, I know we didn't mention it, but cadence is actually the word that you want to be chasing. Um, working on your cadence is the pace in which that you are speaking uh, your sentence. Uh, for example, um, an easy way to explain cadence would be, uh, when you're talking about an Irishman, an Irishman's cadence is actually quite fast, so you actually hear the words that they put together in a single sentence it tends to be pretty rambly, but gets all together. Whereas if you're talking about a larger, more stony disposition, then the cadence drops. Means every few seconds you have a word and things get drawn out. So pacing it between the pitches that you need to and finding that nice rhythm, simply practicing that, you'll eventually end up with this you know, beautiful, very melodic, um, very feminine uh, voice, I think. Um, I mean, unless you disagree, and I think that's... I'm very interested because um, for us, the term for us that is to say, in the music world specifically, the term cadence refers to the final part of anything. Uh, it's from cadence, which means to fall. Um, so it's literally the end is called the cadence. Whereas what you're referring to, and this is literally just nomenclature, mm -hmm. I'm referring to, uh, I would call it tempo, and it's literally the speed at which things happen. So my native tempo is very fast. I'm a fast person. I talk really fast. Um, but when I'm playing a character who is more thoughtful, I will slow it down. Hmm. Um, if I'm trying to play a character who's more sinister, I will also slow it down. So there are different ways and different connotations you can get from 
the tempo of your voice and the tempo, the, the speed at which you actually say the words. Um, and in addition to that, you can play then with, again, in the music world, it would be called legato or staccato. So the, the smoothness or pointiness of the way you say your words, because if I speak slowly, but I speak in a very pointy way, it's different than if I speak slowly, but I speak in a very joined up way. And these are all subtleties that you can bring into either masculine or feminine mm -hmm. to give yourself more color and more variation within the characterization of your voice. Absolutely. Um, another very important part of any kind of performance, and I mean any kind of performance, is proper breathing technique. Um, doing a lot of voice acting work myself, um, the, the resonance that comes from uh, your voice plays a super important part of, um, of the, the, the end accent that you end up having. Uh, and that brings me on to our next bit of, um, of characteristics for our voice. And that is, of course, the resonance of a voice. Uh, Janet, go through a little bit of uh, how one can play and one can work with resonance. I love resonance. As a singer, we use it as a tool for everything. It's it's used in bass performance technique, but it's also used as color. So when we're talking about resonance, we're talking from a scientific perspective about where the sound waves are bouncing around in your body, because your body is full of cavities, full of spaces. You have spaces here, you have spaces here. These are called the zygomatic spaces. You've got spaces here in the chest cavity. And what, what is resonating and where it's resonating is going to give you a different kind of color in your voice. So for example, when somebody's saying they have a nasal voice, what they mean is it's, it's resonating here. So a nasal voice is resonating on the front, right? I'm cutting off the resonance here and I'm only allowing it to resonate at the front. And what I'm changing is literally just where the voice is buzzing. Mm. Whereas if and you were to change... Whereas if you were to change the resonance to, say, the back of your throat, you can end up doing some pretty amazing stuff. Um, uh, for example, uh, Dr. Claw from the Inspector Gadget series. Next time, gadgets. You could uh, create that kind of sharper, more more deep drawl that sort of tears across your um, your vocal cords, which you shouldn't do, by the way, without a lot of practice. But... Um, yeah, no, the, um, there are many different ways that one can um, use that voice. Now, the one thing that I'm going to say here is a safety tip. The exercises that me and Janet are going to discuss now, uh, do them uh, sporadically. Don't try to force yourself to overexert because you can uh, inevitably damage your vocal cords while doing um, resonance exercises. Um, in addition, if you are using it for a long period of time, like say a four hour role playing game, always make sure that you drink lots of water, avoid sugar and milk if you can. Uh, don't do what I do and always reach for a can of Coke. Uh, that's a very bad habit. <laughs> do as I say, not as I do. Uh, <laughs> but, um, but yes, um, yes, just bear that in mind. Cause, um, yeah, I think of all of these techniques, this is the one that I think I hear most people say, oh, I've lost my voice. And then you lose it for a few days because you've been, you know, working on developing those muscles a bit too hard. Yeah. Any, anything that causes stress to the vocal cords will cause them to swell. And that's when you lose your voice. Yeah. So if it hurts, stop doing it. That mm, is the mm. number one tip, tip of all voice voice work in mm. any space mm. if it's hurting you're doing it wrong you need to stop and you need to either go find help or experiment until you can do it in a way that does, is not damaging you is not hurting you mm. because the last thing you want is to lose your voice and not be able to play that that's just not fun no um so going through the resonance uh spots I find that um, the more uh, male character that I want to play, like the more stereotyped or generic male, um, I start taking in a lot of air and resonance from uh, either my gut, uh, my diaphragm, or like j not where my vocal cords are, but just kind of below the vocal cords. Um, this area here, just where your um, your clavicle is, um, the bronch, uh, the bronch, uh, something, the brontosaurus that's in your chest. 
Look, I, I'm not a biologist, okay? I'm an actor. I pretend like I know things. Give me a script and I'll tell you what it's called. Uh, okay, so um, by resonating these particular areas, you get a very bass tone. And that bass tone uh, can uh, very much portray a male character. Um, whether or not that's um, your rather deep and dark kind of overlord sort of voice, which... Um, which, if I were to describe the resonance, is coming from here just below the chords. Or if you were to take someone who is um, quite scholarly, quite well known, this deeper and darker voice comes from the diaphragm where one speaks and projects like you are an actor. Or if you're going for something really big, you just feel your gut with air, start talking like you're from Birmingham. And there you go, this is um, more or less what he sounds like. You just push yourself. And uh, that's just what it comes out as. Doesn't hurt your throat at all because it's all here in the gut, which I have lots of. How about you? Do you want to give it a crack? Go on. Have a belly yeah, wobble. There's an important thing to mention, which is as I hear your vocal production, I can hear that at all times your throat is open. So instead of, of, of allowing your tongue to go up and cause tension at the back, you're keeping it open, which means that it's a healthy voice production. So any kind of um, any kind if you're trying to give more depth and you're trying to give more space to a voice. So if you're trying to produce a more masculine voice, this is my sort of standard masculine voice where I need to pretend to be a, a little lost what I'm talking about. <laughs> you need to pretend to be a serious man. Serious um, man. Essentially what I'm doing, I've lowered the pitch very slightly, but I've also created a large amount of space at the back of my throat. Now that's allowing resonance here, but it's also not constricting the voice as it and the air as it comes up to vibrate the vocal folds. Mm. And that's all I'm doing. It's very simple. I can talk like that for six hours and not have a problem. There is yep. no tension there. That is healthy vocal production. Um, Fun fact: there are some actual there. There are actually some guys in Europe who are like full-on metal singers like you know the ones that sort of like roar into the mic metal scream yeah, yeah yeah they do that and they can do that for hours because they they use that technique you're describing and that it doesn't put any strain on their vocal cords at all so that's yeah that's Absolutely. that's a great I, that's a great bit of advice there so that's always what we're shooting for and in general if you want more resonance you need to create more space mm. so if you want a more booming voice you want a louder voice you want a, a darker tone to your voice. This is all characteristics of resonance. Mm -hmm. You need to create more space in your cavity. So that means making sure that you're sitting up straight. Mm -hmm. It means making sure that you're, you get a sort of yawn feeling at the back of your throat. And that's going to give you the space you need to create a darker, boomier voice. Mm. It's, it's really that simple. It's just physics. Yeah. Uh, the opposite is also true, of course, if you use a lack of resonance or resonance, sorry, um, that can also create a um, an entirely different vibe as well. Um, I, I he I'm hesitant to say that that's a, a, the, the, the on the female spectrum of of resonance. I mean, for me, whenever I do it, it sounds like I'm an elf. You know, <laughs> like I always I always feel like. And that's when I told him last time that I was not going to receive any further guests this is not resonating anywhere it's just simply coming out of my mouth like breath flowing from my lips which sounds awful because i hate elves i do i hate them so much you hate elves who hates I, elves dude they're wankers i'm australian like let's let's face it you know we're orcs that's what we are i don't <laughs> i don't pretend <laughs> I love that. Um, yeah, so uh, there's a lot of things that you can do. And I would also always advise never do this for a main character because you don't want to be stuck in this space for too long. But you can use tension to create different kinds of voices. So you can change the position of your tongue and your mouth to make it more tight. So you talk like this and it creates a different space. It's more tense. I don't stress to do it for very long. But it's, it's a different kind of voice, right? It's, it's, that's my goblin voice. It's, it's really fun, but I would never play a goblin as a player character because I wouldn't want to commit to doing that for two hours because mm. it, it, it tension, it hurts. Mm. You know, you can also, um, when what you just did with your elves, I don't know if you noticed that, is that you, you brought in a lot of breathiness to your voice. Uh, and that's another tonal thing that you can play with. It's, um, it gives you another color. Mm. And breathiness is something that is often associated with women. And it's often something that women bring in particularly as a sort of seductive thing 
So, you know, nobody is a monolith. Women talk in different ways in different spaces in different contexts. But if a woman is trying to be seductive, it's very common that she might use a bit more breathiness in her voice. And that's not a male characteristic. Men don't do that in the same way, in my experience. Unless they're trying to get drinks at very specific bars. Right, um, sure. And again, yeah. nobody's a monolith. People talk in different ways in exactly. different contexts. <laughs> All right. And, uh, of course, the next thing, uh, the next uh, subtopic of here of uh, gender performance is language. The uh, the choice in words and the choice of... Uh, you love the etymology of language, don't you, my dear? Uh, I'm, I'm such a nerd. I, I feel like I'm going to sit back on this one. Um, while I like language and my vocabulary is quite stellar, I, I bow down in uh, in awe of what uh, of what Janet is is, is capable of so uh, language is so important because uh, obviously men and women whether or not they realize it um, well it's not even just men and women like let's let's throw that out the window first and foremost everyone I I mean different cultures even subcultures um, you know everyone uses different languages even if everyone speaks English there's different tones different accents different um, uh, different uh, slang, you know, that that instantly define and categorize individuals. For example, um, the way as an Australian, I say a lot of vowels. Uh, when I really round my vowels out, you can tell I'm Australian, and that's the language being used together with everything we've discussed up until this point. For example, if I tell people, you know, quit chucking, ch quit chucking a wobbly, you know, it doesn't matter if you say it. Oh, would you quit chucking a wobbly? It doesn't matter what tone you use. Throwing a fit. Yeah. Throwing a fit, right? Throwing a fit, Throwing. yeah. Yes, that's what Chuck and a Wobbly is. Idioms. I love that. It's awesome. <laughs> but um, but it doesn't matter what your voice sounds like. The language itself is what paints the picture here. So, um, so tell us, walk us through the etymology of languages between the genders, Janet. Well, we're not going to go etymology, which is... No, um, what's etymology? Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm using wrong words. I, I By the way, like I said, if I had a script... I'd be on point. Janet is here to correct me because Janet is a scholar and I am a trained monkey with a fez. Nerd, nerd. The term is nerd and I am. I accept it gloriously. Um, <laughs> that's such a cute monkey. Right, okay, let's, <laughs> let's talk about uh, vocabulary choices. So there's a lot you, you can do with this. Um, and uh, the number one way that I use this for my own characterization is not just gender, but is um, displaying uh, education level. So people who are more educated use longer words, bigger words, different words. They are generally more articulate, which means they are better at finding the exact word they're looking for rather than like mashing a couple of words together to try and say the thing that they're trying to say, right? Um, but, <laughs> but specifically between the genders, um men and again this is this is a subject that i researched because it was one where i was like i think this is true from my experiences but i will double check so i went and looked up some studies studies show that men are more likely to talk about objects women are more likely to talk about people men are more likely to talk about facts women are more likely to talk about feelings this is general trends so this is not specific we when we talk about trends like this we talk about trends and stereotypes we're not saying all women do this and all men do that we're saying there is a tendency as a gender divide for this thing so when you're playing female characters make sure you talk about the people who are around you make sure you talk about the way that your character is feeling if you're playing a male character maybe consider talking more about things about the objects that are around you about the facts that you know rather than the way you feel about them. And this is going to help you portray the male or female character in the way that you want to, or create a different dynamic to a character or a complexity to a character by playing mm. the other. I think a great example of that is um, trying to ask or show concern for someone. Um, allow me to give you an example. A, a, a male character in this example might say something like, you look upset. Right. Whereas a woman would say, are you all right? Or how are you feeling? One incites that emotional response and searches the feelings, whereas the other is simply a statement of fact. It's like, yes, dumbass, I'm frowning at you and I'm throwing knives at the wall. Of course, I'm upset. 
you know, uh, which is I, I'm sure if you're you're in the the male demographic, you've you've definitely been there with me as well. Um, yes. I have thrown things at the wall before. Don't <laughs> think that's just a male trait. No, 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 um, no. I mean, I mean, being responsible for the things being thrown at the wall. Like I, I've definitely had moments where I've been like, "You look upset." You think? And it's like, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, it was, it was. Sorry, that was my, my bad. I was trying to instigate a conversation with a dragon. Don't tell my girlfriend. She's watching this. <laughs> She's in the next room. I would say um, a really good example of this is if somebody gets injured. A man would ask, is it bleeding? <laughs> Object, fact. A woman would ask, are you feeling okay? So it's the, for the woman, it's person and emotion. For the man, it's fact and object. Is it bleeding? Fact, mm. object. Mm. For the woman, it's are you okay? Emotion, person. And these are the different responses that you can play with. Mm. So um, yeah, it, it just it's a, just another palette that you can use. It's another It's another set of choices that you can use. Mm. Um, yeah, absolutely. And um, when we're talking about the space of role playing, uh, one thing I would also say is uh, a very male uh, thing to do is to establish your physical sense within the role play. Um, so, for example, with a female character, um, I would not necessarily describe her as she moves physically through the space. I would be very almost poetic about it. Um, like, uh, for example, Elandra enters with a uh, oh, the smell of perfume. It's more of a, a sensory adventure. Her hair, like the uh, the auburn um, uh, twilight, and as she gazes upon you with her her sensual eyes, she speaks to you in soft tones. These descriptive words are sensations, whereas with a, uh, a male character, what I would describe as, um, you know, this uh, large, stoic um, figure with an athletic build, stubble over his chin as he walks through, striding boldly, looks poignantly at uh, his quarry and says something dumb. Uh, you know, like the, <laughs> the, uh, the, the idea of, of, of occupying a physical space is very much how in a narrative I describe my male characters, whereas um, sensations and emotions and feelings is how I would describe those female characters moving through the same space. That is so interesting. And you can even take it to the next level where you describe your men as fact and object. So mm. how they influence the world around them and you describe your women as how they make you feel and how how yeah so so mm. more more into that space and how they interact with others so that is that is a tool that you could use as a gm i wouldn't overuse it but it is absolutely a tool and then on the other hand you know if you have a male diplomat come in you know you get a waft of perfume as he comes in and you're instantly wowed by his charisma mm. he turns to smile at you a light tings off his his um <laughs> His tooth, and he says, "Good morning." Um, look, take a look at me. Now look down. Now back to me. <laughs> no, no, we're not going to do that. I'm not going to do it. Uh, <laughs> so um, the next, uh, we're, we're we're running very over time. So I do apologize for the people who have to endure thirty minutes of us uh, laughing at each other. Uh, we have so much fun together. Um, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna try and nail through these last two things uh, by combining them sort of together and talk about the physical side of uh, performing uh, for gender performances uh, through what we're going to start with facial expressions and then go on to uh, gesture and posture. So uh, Janet, what are your observations for the differences between um, facial expressions between men and women? So women in general are more expressive than men facially. Um, they show much more um, as they speak and they show what nice one <laughs> they show what they are what they are feeling as they speak uh, that's not to say they can't hide it but by default that is that is the way that, that they tend to be again this is something that I went back and found studies for to check that this was correct because it's something that I had believed but did not have empirical proof for I now have empirical proof for I went and found some studies it's very interesting um, the other thing is that women tend to move their hands a lot more as they speak and I can see that I'm doing it right now um, but also as women interact with others and this was this was for me one of the most interesting things that I found in my research women nod along as somebody else is talking to show that they are listening men nod along only when they agree so these are the small differences that you can play with 
as you interact with others and as you create an expressive palette, both facially and gesturally for your characters. Um, with men, maybe fewer gestures, maybe more firm gestures. Uh, and with women, it's it's a little bit more diaphanous and you'll see a lot more movement in the face. I would absolutely agree with that. I, um, I definitely think that um, my effeminate characters do tend to have a lot more gestures, but I think um, the smoothness of said gestures um, is, is definitely part of it as well. Um, like, for example, when I am uh, gesturing as, as a, uh, a man, um, my gestures will be firm and poignant and will enunciate or um, uh, ac accent a point I'm trying to make. So I might say, um, my lord, when I returned from war, there were three dragons, all of which were as tall as buildings, and they came down upon my patrol and it was all we could do to just escape. Each point is being accented, not just the whole thing. Whereas with a um, with a female character, what I might do is I might pretend like I have a quill in my hand, or I have something delicate, uh, a feather, a cloth, a handkerchief, something that flows and moves. And as I'm discussing, as I'm talking, it's more that I am inviting someone with whatever I, a soft and delicate object I have in my hand to engage with what I'm saying so that they can participate because this is an engagement. It's not just me giving you information as we were talking about before. It is me inviting you to share an experience. And that's uh, that's at least how I feel the, the female communication goes with my role play characters. Very interesting, very cool. There's a lot that can be said as well for cultural gesture. So um, my favorite example of this is that this in Italy is Che fai? What are you doing? Right? This in India is food. You want to eat? You want Same to eat? Gesture. You want to eat? You want exactly. to eat? Exactly. So culturally, gestures also play an important part in how we express ourselves. Um, and that's something that you can play with if you are adopting a real world accent, you can play with the gesture associated with that. Mm. Or if you are creating your world building, you can create gestures and a gestural language that is specific to a culture, specific to an ethnicity that you have created. It's an extra step. I'm not saying it's not a bit of work, but it can create a very interesting dynamic. Hmm. Well, actually, on, uh, on, on a final sort of side note, I guess, this is kind of like a secret note uh, at the 30 minute mark. Uh, um, don't forget that while the differences between genders is super, super, super important, that we play in a world that is fantastical. It is the realm of our imagination. And um, who is to say that there are even two genders? Um, in games like Starfinder, for example, there is a... Um, uh, a race, I want to call them the Maroi, the Maracoy, uh, you guys know what it is. It's basically this monkey that has seven genders, uh, the, each of which are unique and have their own identity, uh, each of which could very easily have their own nuances, their own shapes, their own sounds, uh, and they're only going to be defined by you as a game master. So while what we discussed here today are, are very, and I want to stress this, very generic techniques to be able to be um, to be able to identify between the the two genders that we perceive, um, there is a whole spectrum of performances that you can use and techniques that you will be able to utilize in order to really hone in and get the performance that you are after. Don't hesitate to break out of the conformity of what we've said. Um, I think we, we discussed this as well um, about um, breaking expectations. Um, for those of you who are fans of Rocco's Modern Life, such as I am, uh, Mrs. Big Head is a uh, female character played by a male voice actor, and the voice is absolutely hilarious, and it shows up in so many different places. Um, uh, in Big Bang Theory as Howard's mum, uh, you probably recognize it as, Howard! Help me out of the bath! <laughs> And even though you know it's a female character, this 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 voice just creates this whole new 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 thing, this new feeling. So so don't hesitate to be able to explore and um, and find the voice that suits the character that you're playing. And I would add that that is a way to make stunningly memorable characters, mm. which is after all, as as GMs or as players, what we're looking for. We're looking for something that makes a mark. So go break out, break the mold. Go make a mark. Speaking of Mark, how do you think his voice goes with Flick? 
oh man, I know that he struggles sometimes to get into it. That so that is an example of a voice that I would never do for a player character because I I love my vocal cords a lot, <laughs> and I I talk and make noises for a living, right? So I would not commit to two hours of um, doing that voice. I think I could do flick for a while. Um, it would take a bit, but um, I could get used to it. No, it's uh, it no, it's a great Wonderful. voice. It's a, it's a fantastic voice, and um, yeah, if you can find the ones that work for you, because oh, and uh, and and lastly, before we sign off, everyone's vocal cords are different. Everyone's yeah. um, everyone's sound, everyone's resonance, everyone's accent. You're gonna find your own voice, and some voices are just gonna work for you uh, that won't work for other people. So you know, play around with the things that make you unique. Use them and add them to your GM toolbox, because yeah, that's that's what everyone does. Yeah, for sure. Fantastic. All right. So thank you again, Janet, for joining us. It was an absolute pleasure discussing this with you. Uh, clearly, because we are getting on the 40-minute mark. So uh, thank you so much, guys, for joining us. I hope this video uh, brought you as much joy and entertainment as it did the both of us. Uh, if it did, then please hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. Be sure to go check out all of our links. Uh, below you will also have some links where you can go and find Janet and all of her amazing stuff. Uh, and of course, if you want to support the Dead Aussie Gamer, then head on over to all of our things as well. Come and check us out if you want to see us role play uh, on the Dungeons and Dragons Twitch channel uh, in Ghosts of Saltmarsh, which hopefully by the time this video is out, uh, we should be embarking sometime soon on Season 2, which I'm not allowed to talk about, but I'm mentioning that there is a Season 2. And we are going to be there and it's going to be awesome. It's going to be amazing. And you're going to be there and you're going to be amazing. So go check that out. Until next time, guys, as always, game hard or die trying. See you guys.